through the carbonate, that's how I got free. Jump it back off because there's no stopping me. Postmodern player, sample tastic, flows ekphrastic. I get drastic, hey, watch the plastic. Yo, I name check and leave you drastic. Welcome to the MacGuffin, episode 253. I'm Spencer. I'm Greg. Today, in honor of uh, the release of The Great Gatsby, mm -hmm. we're talking Tobey Maguire. Yes, we are. Very talented young man. Call him young. Yes, yes. Contemporary. I, to I would us, say, I, like. I would say young, as we were talking about. The dude has done a lot in a very short amount of time. Depends on what you call a short amount of time. Like what? half his life has been acting, oh. if not more. Okay. It's kind of kind of a wunderkind. He's done a lot since he started, which yes. was at a young age. Let's just say that. And we're not gonna. I mean, we're we're gonna not delve into some of those smaller parts. Yeah. We're just gonna sort of jump into the fire, and we're gonna talk about the ice storm. Yes, this is the Ang Lee movie mm -hmm. um, about was it swingers in the seventies? Yes, you know, yes. Uh, suburban Connecticut middle class family experimenting with casual sex, drinking, and having their lives out of control. Woo -hoo. Woo -hoo. Led by Kevin Klein yes. and Sigourney Weaver. That's right. Um, or sorry, Kevin Klein, Joan Allen, and Sigourney Weaver are sort of the adults in the drama. Mm -hmm, I mean, mm -hmm. great cast right there. Then you have additional people like Tobey Maguire and Christina Ricci as brother and sister. Mm -hmm. You have uh, Elijah Wood, Katie David Holmes. Kromholtz, Katie Holmes. Like, there's a just crazy amount of Katie Holmes' film debut. Really? Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. Incredible. You know, uh, it's funny to think about, like, Ang Lee. Ang Lee has had one of the most interesting and diverse careers imaginable. You think, like, Life of Pi. Yes. Uh, Crouching Tiger. Crouching Tiger. Hitting the Hulk. Dragon, the Hulk. Yeah, like, he's all over the place. Incredibly <laughs> talented filmmaker. Definitely. Very divorce. Uh, diverse. Divorce. Divorce. Very appropriate Freudian slip right there. <laughs> uh, you know, it, it's, it's, it's interesting to think about, you know, Tobey Maguire in terms of the early days of his acting, he was really much sort of like the complicated teen in the family a lot of yes. times. Like, you know, you think about some of the other stuff we're going to get to. Mm -hmm. he, he's got like, I don't know. He's the call, troubled youth. Troubled youth. But he also has like this sort of like deadpan style to his acting where it's sort of like it seems somewhat emotionless. And at the that. same time, it's really... Um, there is a lot of emotion to it. Like, it, 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 it's really... He's a really talented actor, and I feel like, you know, he sometimes doesn't get enough appreciation for his work in terms of being sort of somewhat of a steady ship. In terms I can see of, that. like, other people being crazier around him. Yes. But yet, he really is still able to give you a lot. Trying without, to just... Yeah, without mm -hmm. being the most over-the-top character on the screen. I can see that, with the exception of the third Spider-Man movie. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, that, uh, I don't know who to blame for that one, but, you know, uh, I mean, this film, it's its funny, like, I don't know how widely regarded it is. I mean, you think I about... I say not very. I mean, it, it was a modest success. I mean, it made about $12 million worldwide, cost 18 so it wasn't a huge theatrical success, but I think it's gotten a second life very much in terms of um, aftermarket DVD sort of world. For instance, you know, it's a Home entertainment. Yeah, it's Criterion Edition. Oh, We've wow. got it as a Criterion Edition. Very nice. You know, that's always a mark of good quality. Except for Armageddon. Uh, that would <laughs> that can be debated, sir. That can be debated. It's got. I mean, it had a whole bunch of different awards. Like it won Best Screenplay at Cannes. It was nominated for Palme d'Or. Um, let's see what else. Golden Globe nominated for Best Performance for Sigourney Weaver in a supporting role. Wow. You know, it's it's got a lot of sort of smart nominated for a Writers Guild Award. Makes sense. I mean, the writer uh, Rick Moody loved the adapt adaptation. He was so pleased with the film that he sobbed through the end credits. And it was adapted by James Shamos. Hmm. So hmm. he, he got nominated for a lot of stuff. But you nice. know, I mean, it's it's really sort of interesting look at sort of. Uh, that sort of time when this kind of world it wasn't was, necessarily widely known, but wasn't necessarily secret. But it was it was it was more accepted at the same mm. time. Like it was like I don't know if there was more experimentation in terms of like marriages and stuff like that. It's an interesting but, question. Yeah, I don't know. Pre the seventies. Perhaps when, you can tell us, Mister Married Man. Pre, pre the seventies <laughs> when things got all wonky for all relationships of. 
I don't know. all walks of life. Very, very interesting. And it's also interesting to think about, you know, in terms of even just the people involved, like, you know, some people like um, Christina Ricci's role, uh, yes. Natalie Portman turned that role down, for instance. Really? Yeah, so hmm. it's it's crazy to think about all the just, Man. like, incredible casting. And this was in 96, 97. 97, yeah. So, so real early. Between Leon and uh, episode one. Yes. Yes, so, it, I mean, great, great work there. Ang Lee, you know, I, I haven't always been his biggest fan, for instance, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. Like, I'm in that minority that's just not in love with that movie. But Spencer I'm, doesn't like dubs. But I'm also, <laughs> no, that's not, that's not my problem at all. Uh, but I'm also in that minority that really liked, or not really likes, but enjoyed The Hulk. I really yeah. enjoyed The Hulk. Yeah, so. I didn't enjoy um, it as much as The Incredible Hulk, and which I actually really yes. liked. Yes. Unlike it's, almost everyone. Yes. But uh, let's move on okay. to one just a year later that yes. you had raised, and that is Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. Mm-hmm. This is the Hunter, Hunter S. Thompson uh, story directed by Terry, Terry Gilliam, Gilliam. Um, starring Johnny Depp and Benicio Del Toro, mm-hmm. essentially Love it. retelling yes. Hunter S. Thompson's book, which is about essentially him life. getting a gig to go to Vegas to write about a bike race and turning that into an excuse to just use a expense all expenses paid drug vendor yes realistically speaking. yes uh funny you know also on the criterion edition uh you know because it's, it's awesome yes it is yeah. awesome this one this one's uh an easier one to understand just because it's such a unique and creative project and you know you think unique and creative projects Terry Gilliam is right yeah. at the top of that pile. I mean, why wouldn't you join a Terry Gilliam like and Johnny Depp Monkeys, movie? Twelve Monkeys, Brazil, <laughs> stuff uh-huh. like that. The dude is definitely on the fringe Ronnie of Python. creativity. Yeah, <laughs> you know, in terms of Tobey Maguire's role, it's oh, he, kinda, it's a bit part. It's a bit part, but I mean, <laughs> it's characters just known as hitchhiker. Essentially, yeah. like there's yeah. really nothing more to it. He's the only other character other than the two mains that you see for the entire like opening scene. Yes. I mean, because they're driving down that strip, the empty road on to Vegas. But you think you think about this project. I mean, this is Johnny Depp and probably Benicio del Toro before they're really um, quite what they are the, now. Quite what they are now. I mean, this is before Pirates. Benicio won his Academy Award. Or, yeah, yeah, won Academy Award. I think so. Um, and this is before um, all the Pirates jo- movie. I mean, Johnny, Johnny Depp, Depp was just... definitely certainly a popular. Um, a popular but the Pirates has made him so internationally like gigantic just yeah. like Tom Cruise-esque like bl- n- n- household I name I think he's arguably the biggest I mean it's probably him or Will Smith at this point or like arguably the biggest act maybe Brad but yeah Pitt still this is too. like 90's Johnny Depp so you're talking like Benny and June you're talking you know uh, Edward Scissorhands or was that 80's no, that was 90s. No, okay. That was yeah. early 90s, yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I think Sleepy Hollow might have been in the 90s, too. Yes, yeah, it was. Go. It was like 99, though. Okay, 98, yeah. 99. That was after this. Yeah. I mean, this has got to be one of the most sort of interesting comedy movies. Like, <laughs> this is very much not uh, a wide comedy. No. Like, this is very... this, But it's developed such a profound cult following. Like, yeah, and I, I think it, there's a lot of things about it that ring true with people. There's the relatively um, honest, even to the sense of it being villainized, but not being overly villainized, depiction of drug use. Yes. I mean, heavily, you know, heavily used and interpreted through appro- different intoxications. The film is different, and I think that's very much Hunter S. Thompson's writing style, and it's also very much Terry Gilliam's uh ability to weave because he I think he drafted the screenplay if I remember correctly because it was one of those things that had been tossed around and relatively unfilmable and he's like I can do it it's I mean the thing about it is like uh, you know it's I mean I don't want to say it glorifies drug use but it it, def- it definitely makes it much more um, enticing than something like Requiem for a Dream. Oh, yeah. Which was very much sort of a contemporary of this That's film. That's what I'm saying. Which, it, it, it shows the downsides without showing the extreme downsides. But it also also say. makes the downsides, <laughs> in some ways, kind of intriguing. It's sort of like, you know, hmm. Dare, where they're yes. like, yeah, you know, you can get your shit, like, repossessed, but they're like, this is our Dare Corvette that we got from a drug or dealer. Or, like, Beer Fest. Yeah, but, it's, it's, you're, but you're just like, well, you get the Corvette as a drug dealer. That yeah. seems pretty good until exactly. you get busted. I yeah. mean, so it's 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 kind of, it's it's definitely sort of an interesting balance yes. compared to some of those other drug movies, which yes. are much more so aggressive. Also, I want to note that this is one of, uh, I think, only two times that Hunter S. Thompson 
uh, has been played essentially on screen. Mm, yeah, yeah. Johnny yes, Depp and um, Bill Murray in yeah. Where the Buffalo Roam. Yep. So, and it's interesting. I mean, you know, this is famously Johnny Depp spent months with Hunter S. Thompson. Hunter S. Thompson shaved Johnny Depp's head himself when he first personally wow. did it, wearing a miner's helmet. Um, Their relationship is definitely very serious. I know, yeah. like he was involved with Hunter S. Thompson's funeral. Yeah, that. and they well, they were going to work on the rum. They were going to make the rum diary before Hunter S. Thompson died, mm -hmm. and he was involved in this estate. But the shirt that Toby Maguire is wearing when he gets picked up is uh, a Ralph Steadman animation, and Ralph Steadman did all of the art for Hunter S. Thompson's books, as well as did the um, the typeface of the credits is based on his handwriting. He had a very specific style. So yeah, I can see that. Toby Maguire was very much embodying that artistic style in the movie. What's funny to think about, you know, in terms of like, I mean, I'm sure this is probably not, I mean, not to speak of Tobey Maguire, but it's just funny to think about, you know, in terms of the billing of the film, yes. it's essentially Johnny Depp, Benicio Del Toro, Tobey Maguire. And, you know, whether or not that's an accurate <laughs> depiction <laughs> of what, actually, I mean, whether it's, yeah. you know, order of appearance or whatever you want yeah. to call it. I mean, I'm sure it exists, but yeah. like, I, if I were a young actor like him, I totally would be fucking throwing that up Every yeah. which way but loose. Yeah. But that's pretty awesome. Ranked third in the yes. film. <laughs> For me, though, like, it really, it was actually the same year, but it wasn't yeah. until Pleasantville that uh, Definitely. Tobey Maguire really hit his stride. And this is a much larger part about a brother and sister who are sort of transported to another world yeah, that is a black and white, black and white world. And as people begin to feel emotions, color starts to yes. be introduced. It's very Leave It to Beaver type of... Uh, setting that they are yes. transported well, into. They, they go to, yeah, but they're, once they introduce their sort yes. of different yes, style, it changes the world and starts to introduce color. And mm -hmm. it's 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 both like a sort of a beautiful metaphor and a really sort of interesting movie as these... Definitely. I mean, you've got Reese Witherspoon as a sister. Um, once again, reunited with Joan Allen. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, they come from very sort of different perspectives where Tobey Maguire is sort of more uptight and um, serious. Yes. She's much more sort of loose and wild. And, you know, they become, they initially have sort of this problem with each other, but they begin to accept each other and um, they sort of begin to bond with the folks in the town and sort of their experiences begin to influence each other and they begin to realize that perhaps just because everything's perfect on the surface does not mean that it's perfect Correct. everywhere. Yes, and it's not always about black and white because that's one of the things about that the show or that the sh that's so appealing to uh, Tobey Maguire's character is that the show is all about black and whites. There aren't these troublesome gray areas, mm -hmm. you know, or these other things that could be problems. There's just simples. So things get really complicated when they get there, not surprisingly. And I mean, you got to give a lot of credit to the director Gary Ross, who is also the writer. Um, this is a name that will come back in our discussion and is going to come into regular vernacular because he directed Seabiscuit, okay. which returns him to working with Toby McGuire. Mm -hmm. And most uh, relevant to current times, he's directing the new Hunger Games movie. I see. So, you know, that's that's kind of a... Or sorry, he directed the original Hunger Games movie. Oh, okay. Actually. So okay. He, he blew up nice. big time with that. So, um, you know, it's, it's a very important... Person. And it's such a visually stunning film. It's clear yeah. how that plays a part into the other works he's done. I think it's interesting that um, uh, Jennifer, um, Reese Witherspoon's character, when yes. she enters Pleasantville, the name she takes on is Mary Sue, mm -hmm. which is, you know, it's a term that originated in fan fiction. Mary Sue, not the name, just Mary Sue as a term, originated mm -hmm. fan fiction to describe a character who comes into the character's lives and completely solves all of their problems. And it's also a fan fiction term for when the author, often female, inserts himself or herself as a character into the story. So it's kind of an interesting little, you know, uh, I don't know who exactly wrote the original thing, if it's male or female, but if it's female, that would be rather interesting. Yep. It's, it's funny to think about also, though, you know, we talk about how beautiful this film is. Mm -hmm. The film got nominated for uh, several um, Academy Awards. Really? Let's see, it got nominated for, I believe, Best... Um, best... Uh, achievements in, uh, in terms of, let's see... Um, Art direction and costume design. Oh wow! Now oh, I can totally see that. Unfortunately, unfortunately, it did not win either. But you know, it's, it's, it, it was a tough, tough time to be at like the 99 Academy Awards because that's when like you know, um, 
American Beauty oh, yeah. was really dominating a lot of ways. And, or sorry, Shakespeare in Love was Ugh. dominating. Um, and Damn, obviously cool. that's going to probably take a lot of those art direction yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. So it's, it's really quite unfortunate that it didn't win, but you know, I mean, between this and uh, Shakespeare in Love, yeah, it won. Shakespeare in Love won both art direction and costume Son design. Son of yeah. a <gasps> Yeah. Uh, but in terms of, like, that, I would definitely give it to Pleasantville. I found oh, Pleasantville yeah. to be way more creative and unique in definitely. terms of that kind of stuff. I mean, how many people uh, recreating Victorian England? Wow, that hasn't... Or England, that hasn't every been done. every year, multiple yeah. times. There's regular shows about it in BBC all year round. <laughs> yeah. But, anywho. Um, but... Let me check. I, I want to check on that writer thing because I think it might have just been um, written by Gary Ross. He <laughs> might have. I don't. I don't know if it was adapted. Um, yeah, it was just written by Gary Ross. So wow. You know, talented as a director, talented as a writer. Not yeah. given enough credit there for Seriously. sure. Seriously. Uh, let's move right along. You know, just another year forward. Yep. And we're going to talk the Cider House rules. Another angsty teen role. Yeah, this one This one was adapted, though, from John Irving. Yes. Uh, I believe John Irving adapted John Irving for this yes. in terms of the screenplay. One of the attractions that John Irving wanted to adapt the film in the first place is that he wanted his son, Colin Irving, to play the role of Wally Worthington. However, the development process took over a decade. Uh, eventually, Absolutely his son was too old for the part and was not known enough to be considered for it in any event, even if he had been. Um, this is a story of Homer Wells, who's a kid who grows up in an orphanage, who sort of becomes the uh, successor heir yes. to the orphanage heir in terms of like to, uh, to running it. Yeah, the main doctor, doctor. Played by Michael Caine. Yep. And, um, you know, whether it's, what do, you, what do you want to call it, rebellion or whatever, he decides to go out and explore the world yes. on his own. You know, he, he goes and he picks apples mm -hmm. and he... He uh, meets a a couple, a couple, so Paul, Paul Rudd, Rudd and, and Charlize Theron. That's right. Yes, a couple. He was uh, in the military. Mm -hmm. who ultimately, his injuries come into play. Yeah, uh, to World War Two, I believe. But you know, he sort of he goes out in the world and he sort of ultimately gains an appreciation from where he came from, yes. and he sort of comes back to his home ultimately. And you know. I mean, beautiful, beautiful movie. Again, very well shot. Got a lot of flack for its uh, heavy use of uh, abortion. Yes, that was definitely a significant part of the plot. And, you know... You know, it's a significant part of the plot, but it's not a significant not plot part of necessarily... It's not a hugely significant part of the thematic elements of the film. But there's also, like, is there incest going on, too? Yeah, I think something... With Delroy yeah, Lindo the, and yeah, his daughter, yeah, and that's how she, Rape. Yeah, yeah. Like, it's, like there's, there's a whole thing going on there. I mean, yeah. uh, was it Lass Holstrom um, is, is the one who directed, and he's no sort of... Um, <laughs> yeah. No, slouch to no, controversy. Exactly. Yeah, you know, he, he's done a lot of stuff. Like he did. Uh, was it what it's, what's eating Gilbert Grape? Mm -hmm. You know, he's done uh, the shipping news. So like he's done some stuff over time that's not necessarily hugely provocative, but he's definitely not shied away from films that have uh, riled people yes. up, so to speak. That's definitely true. But you know, I think there's just something wonderful about the symmetry of this movie like you gotta love like Michael Caine um, an ether addicted abortion doctor right, running like, an orphanage right, he's, de he's definitely uh, I love characterization like he's that. definitely a very flawed character but he's still very empathetic oh definitely uh, he's definitely and, a father figure and he's very like he's very sweet towards Tobey Maguire and he doesn't necessarily realize that until later on in the process but it's it's I mean it's got like some of the most sort of signature lines was it like um good night you princes of new england yes. kings of or princes of yep. whatever the kings quote. of new england uh which is i mean such a memorable yorkshire mem maybe prince of yorkshire. no no um, <laughs> su <laughs> such a, such a memorable um plot lines and mm. it's 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 such a wonderful thing at the end when toby Maguire is reciting them yes. because that's what they michael kane would say every night before they go to sleep and it's just it's just uh, picking up the mantle yeah, it's it's sort of a really it's, it's sort of like 
on the surface is a very sort of simple plot of a yes. man sort of going off in the world. But when you go beneath it, as you said, like there's things like abortions and um, mm -hmm. uh, injuries through military yes. affairs, you know, yeah. all sorts of stuff like that. And it's really interesting. You know, won a couple Academy Awards. Oh. Uh, Michael Caine won for Best Supporting Actor. Boom. And John Irving won for Best uh, Adapted Screenplay. Perfect. I uh, was also nominated for Best Picture, Best Director, Best Art Direction, uh, let's see, Best Editing, Best Music. Like, yeah. Dang. Very well respected. It's kind of a shame that Tobey Maguire didn't get nominated for any acting, but he was very solid in the movie. Like, again, you know, it's that very much that sort of like um, straight, simplistic yes. sort of like restrained emotion kind mm -hmm. of part that doesn't get enough credit. I think I think it's very challenging it's, to not go over the top. Yeah, it's hard acting. to make it look like you could put a wall up without just looking like you're not doing anything. Yeah, I think that's the thing. People <laughs> think that you're not doing anything yeah. where it's like it's easy to overact and people seem to love that sort of stuff. It's definitely true. I mean Johnny Depp's made a career the last decade <laughs> doing it. Of just overacting? Yeah. yeah. But you know <laughs> I, I mean I think the point at which you started to see Tobey Maguire really sort of hitting his stride, though, was yes. uh, Wonder Boys. Yes. And it's the story of a writer played by Michael Douglas, who's That's also right. an English professor, who's just completely blocked as he's trying to write his new novel. Yes. And he's got students, Katie Holmes yep. and Tobey Maguire reuniting. There you go. Um, and Tobey Maguire is sort of this... I don't Clever, know which, he's kind Albert. of a delinquent, yeah. but he's also sort of this like um, he's diamond in the rough. He's, 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 yeah, he's sort of like this. What he uh, he's uh, sort of a genius. What do yeah. you want to call it? A tour. A tour. Yeah. yeah. Like he's sort of he's he's very uh, creative, but yeah, he's sort of got these huge problems with mm -hmm. him. Like he's a kleptomaniac. Yes. Um, he gets into this kind of real, a liar. Yeah. He's, he's so <laughs> like a, I think he's a. Um, uh, what's it called? Fraud. Not a fraud. Uh, oh. Compulsive liar. Yes, that's right. Uh, yes. He gets into a sort of weird relationship with uh, Michael Douglas's agent, Robert Downey Jr., mm -hmm. who has funny. a sort of funny part. Yes. I, I mean, it's, it's sort of this really weird, not weird, uh, curious dynamic of all these different characters sort of existing in this college world. Yeah, and they're all kind of trying to transition to something else and not necessarily yes. doing it that well. And they're also very flawed. Yeah. I mean, we did a roundtable actually about this, I think nice. like two years ago. Uh, but, you know, it, it's a great Michael Douglas part. Very funny, very mm -hmm. uh, sweet. You know, as we've spoken about recently, like he really plays that hard character very well. So it's it's unfortunate that you don't remember these great sort of exactly. smaller parts that he plays. That are very, and he does it really well. Very funny, very sweet. Um, very sort of interesting how he deals with all these. He's sort of like the glue that brings a lot of these characters mm -hmm. together and sort of keeps everything from spiraling out of control, you know. He's having an affair with uh, Francis McDormand. That's right. This, Toby Maguire steals something from her house. Mm -hmm. like, like a Marilyn Monroe thing. Yeah, a yeah. little like, vest, like kills the dog accidentally <laughs> has to cover that up like yeah. it's, it's just this whole disaster <laughs> like he's trying to like hide that he hasn't written his new novel even though he's yep. written like 800 pages of junk like uh -huh. it's, it's just a really fun thing and toby mcguire is this really curious complex again sort of um restrained character but really complex and i think yes. this was the first time people really started beginning to appreciate that sort of i can see that Complexity. I think it's interesting. This film was originally released in February of 2000 to relatively universal praise, especially for the performance of Michael Douglas. There's a lot mm. of talk about it, but with very little fanfare, I guess. Uh, Paramount, the film's distributor, mm, <laughs> uh, decided to re release the film that November with a different marketing campaign that highlighted its strong supporting cast and hopes that it would garner some Oscar nominations. Despite Paramount Vice Chairman Rob Friedman's acknowledgement that no studio had ever successfully re released a movie that had initially flopped. Yeah, it's, it's funny. I mean, it's funny to think about. I mean, it's. Sorry. Yeah, it's. It's kind of. It's definitely sort of a weird. I don't want to call it a niche kind of film. Like, it definitely never I really achieved the critical acclaim that you that sort you, of that would imagine. Deserved. I mean, it's. it's. I mean, directed by Curtis Hansen, who did, like, LA Confidential, Eight Mile. He's done a lot of great things like that. Mm -hmm. It's written by. Um, the novel is by Michael Spohn, who did the John Carter Interesting. film adaptation. And it was uh, the screenplay by Steve Kloves, who did a lot of the Harry Potter mm, movie adaptations. Yes. So, you know, very talented ensemble there. Very great cast, you know. I mean, I think this is more one of those passion projects. Probably. 
in terms of that being the driving force and not necessarily being a wide um, yes dri- like film set up to be a widely regarded f- or widely uh, hit film yeah. like it's not going to be a huge box office maker but it's funny I mean you know, it was nominated it's it's so deep in terms of the talent like it won an Academy Award for uh, Best Original Song by Bob Dylan wow I mean, you got Bob Dylan writing the music in addition to the great cast Dang. and great crew I mean you got <laughs> Best uh, nominated for uh, adapted uh, screenplay um, editing you know it's, it's just a very sort of um, great little film that is underappreciated and I hope more people yeah, go I mean, back and, and check out. Here's just even a little tidbit of how underappreciated the movie is. Uh, all key scenes feature either one of the many actual bridges of Pittsburgh or a depiction, a painting, photo, billboard, etc. of a bridge in the background. And the DVD extras, Kurt Sanson, said that this is meant to represent the fact that so many of the film's characters are at a point in their lives to which they have make to make pivotal decisions about which way for them to go on. I mean, that's a good thing to say in college. College is like a great place for that kind of thing to exist. And, yeah. But, right. And just what a neat... I love when people do stuff like that, when they keep a visual element that isn't necessarily in your face or obvious that represents something that doesn't have to be as itself either obvious. No, it's, a, it's a great one. But this all was a prelude to what yes. was to come next, and that was the smash... And I, I emphasize, Boom. underline, bold yeah. the word yes. smash when I say Spider-Man. Spider-Man. This, I mean, I think it was the first, what, $100 million opening weekend? I believe so. It, I mean, it is it is crazy how successful this thing... I mean, X-Men had come out, I believe, just a year before that. Yes. And that sort of reinvigorated the comic book movie. And when this and hit... And people were like, wait, Spider-Man might actually be good, because yes. X-Men was. Well, I what? mean, Spider-Man was one of those ones that, again, they've been trying to make for years. I think oh, James totally. Cameron or somebody was involved with Yeah, there's been point. so many people like, that have been... <laughs> it's, I mean, it was one of those ones that wasn't, like, really doable for a long yes. time. And, you know, finally... Thank God, CGI. C- CGI and Sam Raimi stepped in and just crushed it. I mean, the film made $800 million worldwide, $115 million opening weekend. With that... The, the nail was done for comic book movies. Yeah. Like, that was the sign that we're on. And then everything was starting to get greenlit mm-hmm. after and that. And he, he's the only... He was the first, not only, the first director to helm all three installments of a superhero mm-hmm. franchise. Because mm-hmm. Singer only did two X-Men movies, and Burton only did two Batman, and Christopher Nolan's the second Obviously person. after that, yeah. yeah. But, and it's, that's a pretty good follow-up. I mean, to go Spider-Man, Batman, man. That's one, you got pretty solid on either side of the two comic worlds as like individual main characters. Well, yeah, let's let's throw this out there, like to begin with. Um, Spider-Man in terms of characters, I would argue top three. I mean, you could argue the order. No, just oh, period. Oh, oh. Like, of all comic yeah. characters, of any comic character you could pick Definitely. to want to make a movie about, he'd agree. be top three. The other two are obviously Batman and Superman. Yeah. Like those are like, Arguably as famous of comic totally characters agree. as anyone. I can't think of anyone even remotely in the sort of discussion. I mean, there are other ones that are important. Yeah. Flash, blah, yeah, blah, there, blah. Yeah, there are other ones that would end up in the top ten, but, but nothing that like would be Like, those top three are, like, yeah. a huge jump in yeah, terms yeah. of, like, <laughs> yeah. in terms of, like, general population awareness. Like, yes, everyone knows these characters. Like, they are worldwide things. Mm-hmm. And so, it was funny, I think, you know, we we had Superman and Batman in the 80s, and it was sort of, like, amazing that it took so much longer yeah. to get uh, Spider-Man on the screen. Flying was a lot easier to fake than swinging. I think that's a lot of what I it was. Because so, yeah. when you look back on those movies, it's not like the flying effects were amazing. But it's just that the flying effects were more convincing than they had been. Yeah. And they and they, they could do with them even that well. But so. it, it, I mean, it was funny to think, like, this really was a much bigger turning point. Like, there were comic book movies before, and, you know, Batman yeah. and Superman were successful. But when this hit, like, it was so successful, like, it completely it took the comic book in my opinion it took the comic book movie and the comic book industry that which was already outside of america and western yeah. culture but really made it international oh no it made, it made it, the superhero movie and an international it thing. made comic books mainstream yeah like it like in an instant everything became mainstream and that's why everything so I, it, it became the most successful opening weekend like instantly mm-hmm. and it was just like okay these are not just nerds and, anymore. And it's only been knocked out of park by other franchises that are completely understandable. It's not any one single movie that's coming out that's, well, maybe out of And frequently, <laughs> and frequently, they are comic book movies. Like, yes. you know, you think Avengers is the current most mm-hmm. successful one with over $200 million. Uh, uh, Iron Man just uh, got number two. 175. Yeah. I mean, very, very, no doubt. And in terms of, you know, characters, uh, 
I, I mean, again, you know, Spider-Man ranks up there in terms of like the most interesting sort of origin or most memorable origin stories. I mean, again, it'd probably be like Batman, then Spider-Man, then maybe like Superman mm, in terms of... Yeah, maybe. Superman's origin story is a little yeah, bit blah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, I would say Uncle Ben dying is probably one of the more interesting... It's right there with Batman mm-hmm. in terms of like clearly defining moment, pushing yep. someone towards being a hero. That literally becomes a everything they do is reminded to that moment. Yeah. Everything. They're constantly driven. And this is like, I mean, this took Tobey Maguire from being sort of like a dramatic actor, <laughs> largely, to like a flat-out action superstar. Yep. Like, he he beefed up for the role Ton. big time. And like all the he, people who later joined the cast in the various incarnations all did massive amounts of work. James Franco did a good amount of work. Willem Dafoe did a amount of work. Thomas Hayden Church and... Uh, and uh, Topher Grace also did a significant amount of bulking up for their roles in the third installment. I mean, I think this was just a combination of like great casting, great timing to get CGI going at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, Good director. I think Sam Raimi really found a way to make it fun. Because, yes. like, S- Spider-Man... He had enough... I think he had enough conviction to realize that even if individual shots or scenes to the outsider might look silly... In some context, the superhero element that's always, you know, when you transfer comic books over, that's too comic-y. But just to follow through with it and make the whole world believable within it. Yeah. And just, like, I mean, every aspect of it was like that. And it would totally, it totally made sense. I think this is one of sort of the ones that sort of more retain the sort of feel of a comic. Yes. First, you, know, you think, like, you, And it semi-contemporized Batman, it without, yeah. like, completely changing it. But, like, you it. know, you think Batman, it was very much sort of like a Tim Burton noir, not yes. uh, gothic sort yes, of style. Uh, X-Men was, was, was comic-y, but, like, they, they toned down, like, you know, Wolverine's costume and stuff mm-hmm. to make it more... Yes. Uh, Fitting it's for more a origin story. Yeah. But, like, this was the first time, you know, it's vibrant colors. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, like, Crazy the green costume goblins. that he sewed himself. Yeah, like, weird radioactive spider. Yeah, like, <laughs> they, they really went all in, and it was sort of a craziness to it. And I think, I think Tobey Maguire just crushed it. I mean, I, I personally still prefer Tobey Maguire to Andrew Garfield. I think Andrew Garfield did a very solid job. I just, I think I Tobey yeah. Maguire really feels more like what I imagine a Peter Parker to be. Yes. Sort of like a sweet guy, but a confused guy. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it just it feels more like of the part. I do also think it's interesting to show, I mean, regardless of how much I might speak trash about it all the time, Spider-Man 3 still, even with you know, being as bad as it was, was still like a ridiculous powerhouse in this trilogy. I mean, it was report at the time. It was the probably has been passed by now. The most expensive film ever made in the U- in U.S. Mm. It had a greenlit budget of two hundred and fifty million. Wow, that is the end budget after march uh, marketing that John Carter was deemed a horrible failure because of reaching. Yeah. Uh, however, with the ground-up development of revolutionary CGI, the cost of shooting in New York, reportedly a million dollars a day, by the wow. way, to shoot Ooh. New York, uh, and extensive reshoots, which overran the production schedule, an additional eight months uh, have led many industry insiders to speculate a final tab of $350 million or more on the production cost wow. alone. If it's true, then only Pirates of the Caribbean, Worlds End, comes in second with a final budget of $300 million. That's crazy. You know... <laughs> I, I think Spider-Man has set the like tone for a lot of things, you know, like too many villains. Oh, um, yeah, definitely. I, th- I think Spider-Man 3 was clearly... See, the failure of the Batman movies later was that they had too many villains, and they failed because of it, and worse and worse directors, and they should have just kept the... Why? Yeah. Why? Why is that a trend? Sp- Spider-Man just really One. jumped into that, though, and it <gasps> became like a really recurring thing. Ugh. You know, I, I mean... I, I still think I would prefer to Spider-Man 4 to The Amazing Spider-Man. I, but, you know, the costs, as you said, like yeah. are so obscene that there's no way it would be more cost-effective to make like a $300 million. Yeah, nobody will, ex- million. nobody will ever, ever allow you to make Spider-Man 4 with a different guy as Spider-Man. At that point, even though you should, you should just recast and get new directors and just call it the next one because, you know what, art styles change in comics and Spider-Man looks different over the years. The so, one thing... The one thing I will say, though, is I actually, in a lot of ways, do prefer the casting of The Amazing Spider-Man to this series. Like, I, besides I Tobey Maguire, I prefer Gwen Stacy. 
uh, with Emma Stone. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I prefer um, what's his name as her father, um, uh, Dennis, Leary. Dennis Leary. Yeah, like you know things like that. that I very much enjoyed. However, more. it's hard to beat J.K. Simmons. Is J.K. Jonah Simmons Jameson. is great. I'll give That's, you that. You're right. Okay, J.K. I think he was born to be J. Jonah Jameson. Yeah, like, like you're, <laughs> you're right there. But like pretty much besides Tommy Guire yeah. and him, like yeah. I, I, no, I, I totally agree. If we could, if we could like do a mashup of the two movies, yes. I would totally be on board. Exactly, J.K. Simmons <laughs> and Tommy awesome. Maguire in the Amazing Spider-Man Two. Yeah. It's funny, though, you know, we are talking about this before we started mm-hmm. filming a segment. After Spider-Man really started happening, Tobey Maguire really hasn't done a heck of a lot of stuff. No. You know, a few things here and there, but not, I mean, you'd think he'd be just constantly yeah. turning out material because yeah, exactly. everything would be coming across him, but yeah. he's been fairly discerning. And one of the sort of more interesting ones that he did was Seabiscuit. Mm-hmm. Uh, we mentioned Gary Ross before. Yes. You know, this is... Uh, I believe only his like second film or something hmm. like that, something obscenely limited. But this is a story of a undersized horse who goes on and competes yes. in the world of With horse a slightly racing. oversized jockey. Slightly oversized jockey, um, but based on a true story. Yes. like this is reality. A slightly oversized, what partially blind? I forget. It's partially blind or deaf. That, uh, uh, I think he's blind. Yeah, like blind in one eye. I yeah, think. I think he has very tunnel vision. <laughs> and he's like. Five seven when you know obviously most uh, jockeys most are like jockeys are five really feet or something yeah. tiny guys. Um, yeah, really interesting movie about yeah. I, I love the fact that Sea Biscuit's like thing, like how he could win was like he got to get a good eye at the horse he was racing to. It'd be like head well, yeah, to head it was it was like he had to have that sense of competition because yeah. he like you know he was a runt. Yes. And he was sort of like, that was the whole thing. Is he, was, he had these great expectations when he was born. Yeah, because he came he was, from a, a litter that was incredibly prolific. Uh, Man of War was his sire. Uh, or, uh, yeah, no, excuse me. His sire, Hardtack, was sired by Man of War, who also sired War Admiral, which is the hor- big horse that he com- has to compete with in the end of the yeah. film. But, I mean, that's the whole... related? That's the whole thing, though, with it is that yeah, this was only um, Pleasantville, then Seabiscuit were basically his other two films. Wow. Finally, Hunger Games. That's it. So pretty, wow. pretty talented guy. Um, but you know, the whole thing was like the horse seemed lazy. It was a runt. It seemed lazy. Yes. It didn't want to you know race, and so it was basically abandoned. And the the whole thing that I like about the movie and it's perhaps a little heavy handed is that you know they're all about you know just because something is flawed like you yes. know the trainer played by Chris exactly. Cooper yes. is like you know he's over the hill he's not respected anymore but he's um, he's brought in, and that's the whole motto of Jeff Bridges essentially you know his his family is, uh, has had huge tragedies mm-hmm. you know Tobey Maguire has issues yep. Seabiscuit has issues but he says you know just because something's wrong with it doesn't mean you give up on it exactly. and I, I mean I think that's a very beautiful idea totally I mean who doesn't want a band of misfits to join together and be better than any of the, the and they have such so. tragedies I mean you know Seabiscuit uh, I think it was it breaks his leg I think so uh, Tobey Maguire gets severely injured and it like can barely walk. Yeah, and like, they have to like replace him for a while yeah. with the other jockey. And it, it's 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 such a bleak story that you know it's you would think it's only Hollywood that can make such a thing reality, but it's just such a beautiful. And, and it's it's movie. interesting. It's one of those things that maybe people didn't think about till all those dot horses died on the making of the HBO show Luck. Mm. But when you think about stuff like this, that you know in modern day film like how do you film some of that stuff and i found it really interesting that th- there's a contraption called the equisizer that they made for the close up action in all in this film it resembled a hobby horse it was a mechanical horse that had springs a wooden head and a carpet body it was affectionately called the ssc biscuit <laughs> in reality it was a 12 foot by 20 foot rolling platform with a steering wheel in the rear and in the front it simulated the rolling action of a running horse, and yet it ran on rails around the track. It was powered by a f- 454 Chevy engine and would go at speeds of 40 to 50 miles an hour. That's so crazy. This big, crazy, rolling mechanical horse that somebody's putting a camera on next to an actual horse that they're riding, or for that they're riding and being filmed next to that they're just riding. That would be some. crazy. I can't even imagine <laughs> trying to do it. But you know, it's just it's. I mean, I love stuff it's like it's. That. The visuals are beautiful. Yes. Again, you know, much like Pleasantville, is very vibrant and mm-hmm. colorful. I mean, it. I mean, it's probably not a surprise in some ways that it was nominated for best picture. Uh, it was nominated for best adapted screenplay, best cinematography, best editing, best art direction, Deserved best costume design. A lot of those. A lot of them designed. Again, you know, it's such such a tragedy in some ways though that Tobey Maguire is not nominated for anything. He literally has never been nominated for an Academy Award. Wow. He's been nominated once. 
for a Golden Globe for Brothers, and that's it, basically, huh. major awards. Like, huh. it's it's such an amazing thing that, like, he's so overlooked in terms of acting performance. And granted, there's a lot of great actors or whatever, but, you know, yeah. you'd think sooner or later somebody would give him some sort of credit. So you're like, what's Spider-Man doing? <laughs> somebody get Spider-Man yeah. on the horn. Yeah, it's just, it's just, it's hard for me to imagine. And, I mean, in terms of why it didn't win the Academy Award, this was the year Return of the King was basically... Cleaning up mm-hmm. everything that the Lord had of the Rings had yeah. brought up. Everything that Lord. Lord of the Rings had been decided to be deserved. Yes. So, it, I mean, they Even though they all should have not been heaped on this one. Right. But nevertheless, they were, they was, I, it was sort of like, yeah. you know, the the after the fact mm-hmm. sort of credit. Yeah, I know. With all the West I know. End, so. But it's totally, it totally re- suffers from uh, Return of the Jedi problems, yeah. where it's not the strongest in the trilogy. But, you know, nevertheless, whatever. <laughs> anyway, that brings us to this Friday, yeah. May 10th. We're discussing The Great Gatsby. F. Scott Fitch. Gerald's yes. classic book that most of you probably had to read in school, but yeah. I didn't. <laughs> really? How'd you get out of Just my school didn't have it as a requirement. That's it wasn't why... like I got out of the requirement. It was like it wasn't a requirement at my school, but I knew a lot of people who did. That's why Greg calls it education. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's why I call it the, the great Gad- Gattis- Gattisby by F- Scott. <laughs> I always wondered why he was called F- Scott. Uh, no. Education. Uh. <laughs> you got a good one. Anyway, you know, yeah, classic book that, you know... Starring Leonardo DiCaprio as Gatsby himself. Yes. Uh, the story is told, though, from Tobey Maguire's Nick Carraway. Yes. Um, He's the narrator, yeah. as you might put it. And, you know, it's about a guy who has sort of a lavish lifestyle, but yes. is in love with a woman played by Carrie, Carrie Mulligan, who's uh, married to another man, played by Joel Edgerton. And, nice. You know, the conflict that rises mm-hmm. from that uh, love. Yes. And it's directed by Baz Luhrmann. Who yes, it is. Quite a well-known director, especially visually, you know. Yes, Moulin Rouge. Uh, Romeo and Juliet, mm-hmm. Australia. Like, the dude has a profound... It's yes, very lush history. and extravagant-looking films. Yes. Always and this over one the top. And this very is... much looks that way as well. He's very good at... Um, pairing music with film as well that, and this looks well, very yes. much sort of in the same way you know sort of like you know Quentin Tarantino is always sort of given a lot of credit for his pairing of music yes. in movies this is very much sort of the same yeah, way yeah he's really good at just like the kind of opulent lavish ness of filmmaking he's really good at making things yes. shine and which sparkle. I mean the, the trailer for this is done very much a noteworthy of it using like a lot of like Jay Z and stuff mm-hmm. uh, paired with the Great Gatsby and sort of it's in some ways feels very contemporized in some ways feels very sort of of the time yes. period piece. Yeah. And I thought I think that's just for the trailer. I hope. I don't know. We'll find out soon. Soon enough. We'll find out May tenth. But you know, I, I mean, I'm very much looking forward to it. I like the novel. I like it's that the thing that sort of is the disconnect for me is that like I never imagined it sort of as grandiose and as. Um, extravagant mm. as it is in the movie or it looks in the movie and I, I'm not saying that will be a good thing or a bad thing but it's very just different from how I read it in my yes. mind when I read the book. Well that's one of the things that's already being criticized for is that yet again it's an example of Hollywood getting flappers wrong because it's mm. totally turning the flapper fashion style It the film takes the flapper look and turns it into a fashion style when the whole point of wearing flapper clothing in the first place was to look androgynous and to look mm. boy like and thin and not to be necessarily overly ap- opulent so but that's one of those things that always happens when you have but that's flapper. interesting because you know generally um Baz Luhrmann is a pretty thoughtful filmmaker like he really thinks a lot about the details and I guess you know that's one of those times that artistic ideas trump that's perhaps historical what, reality yeah, it's probably the idea of like having all these shiny things but then having all these like glittery and shiny but like purposefully frumpy looking fl- boyish flappers maybe ruined his Hollywood image of it yeah but again you know this is very much Tobey Maguire sort of playing the steady role and uh, like you know man. obviously Leonardo DiCaprio who's good friends with Tobey Maguire they go back yes. a long way like they were in this boy's life together like two decades before this <laughs> even though Tobey Maguire's role was much smaller than Leonardo DiCaprio's how surprising but, yes uh, but nevertheless they've known each other for a long time so there's definitely a natural chemistry between yes. the two of them which is very good but you know DiCaprio is very much over the top you know the 
the glove story is definitely a very grandiose thing, you know. Yep. The uh, I believe it's in 3D. Is it in 3D? Probably. It is in 3D. 3D. Yes, but it is not a musical. Thankfully, I was worried about that for yeah. a while, but thankfully, it's and didn't not. put 3D in its title, so yeah. I can at least thank them for that. Yes, I don't know. I'm I'm looking forward to. It. I think the trailers look very lush. The story is one I liked as uh, a youth. Yes. Um, so I'm still remaining hopeful that it will be good. I expect much like the original F. Scott Fitzgerald uh, source material. It will be something that a lot of people will care about. I will not, and it will pass me by unnoticed. And it, much like, you know, Bez Lerman's previous work of Australia, it is long. It is almost two and a half hours. So I uh, hope you get a comfy seat when you sit down to check <laughs> and it out. don't drink any fluids. Yeah, because it's going to be a long one. Mm -hmm. But uh, that's Toby Maguire. Yes. Let us know what you like of him. Brothers is another great film. There's a bunch of other ones out there that are solid films. Yes. But uh, we didn't have time to mention. So write in and let us know about those. Please do. And as always, we're at MacGuffinPodcast.com, Twitter.com, slash MacGuffinCast, Facebook.com, uh, Slash McGuffin Podcast. Ha, three, Phone number 323-761-9842. We're on iTunes. We're on Miro. We're on Blip.tv. Roku. Check us in. At, check in at Get Glue and get some stickers. Mm -hmm. Get some stars the iTunes. Give us some, some stars. Yep. You don't get them. You get them. No, see, when you put them on the screen, they're awarded to you. How many you can see is how many you own. I see. So when you yeah. spend them, you get unstar them. things. Mm. And then uh, <laughs> yeah. thumbs on YouTube. Yeah. And uh, join us next time for a DVD rundown for mm -hmm. the week of May 14th. Yep. Wow. Halfway through May. See you next time.